Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Energy 808, the cutting edge. We talk about Molokai Energy News, news about energy from Molokai. And my co-host in the matter is Marco Mangelsdorf, and our guest today is Ali Andrews. But we don't know Ali yet. So, Marco, would you undertake to introduce Ali Andrews? Absolutely. First of all, uh, greetings, me, hermano, from a different madre, Jay Fidel. It's uh, always a treat to be back sharing screen time with, with, my, with my dear friend Jay. So yeah, I'm so pleased, so very pleased to be able to introduce and welcome uh, Ali Andrews to our gathering today. Molokai is uh, of course, I always had a very uh, near and dear place in my heart for geez, uh, five, six or so of my life. So to be able to talk to someone who has uh, an equal affinity and love for the Friendly Isle is really quite a treat. So thank you so much, Ali. So for Ali's intro, Ali Andrews is the CEO of Shake Energy Collaborative, a woman-owned public benefit corporation, also known as the V Corp, developing renewable energy projects that are designed and owned by the communities that host them. Shake was born out of research for her master's in design impact at Stanford University down the street from my old stomping grounds in which Ali and her team explored designs for more meaningful bi-directional community engagement in the energy industry. Shake is currently partnering with historically disinvested communities in the San Joaquin Valley in California and in Hawaii, including the newly found Ho'ahu Energy Cooperative Molokai. Ali has a background in climate research and environmental storytelling. I like that environmental storytelling a lot. Working on projects for NOAA, the state of Hawaii and the Polynesian Voyaging Center and all uh, Nainoa's, uh, Nainoa Thompson's uh, gathering. She has an MS in engineering design impact and a BA in physics and environmental nonfiction writing. Also from Stanford, I assume? No. Okay, where, where was your, uh, your BA from? A uh, little school in Vermont called Middlebury College. I know Middlebury. My beloved Auntie Charlotte went to Middlebury long, long ago. So great school. So with that, uh, again, uh, I'm uh, so pleased to have you here with us, Ali. So uh, that was kind of the official intro. Mm -hmm. I would really appreciate uh, to lead off understanding. I'd really like to understand how is it that your head and your heart drew you to the special island of Molokai. Mm -hmm. um, that's a great question. Um, I think I was drawn first to the idea of community engagement in the energy industry, uh, living and working in Hawaii and, and seeing various projects run up against communities and seeing their, their struggle against uh, projects that didn't fit with their values and, and also that piece about environmental storytelling in my professional background was, was getting to interview communities about how they're adapting to climate change, how they're seeing sea level rise, and really seeing the power in that. Uh, so I was doing research for my master's uh, in Honolulu, summer of 2018, um, around community engagement. That's when Marco, you and I first met um, over a cream puff at Lily <laughs> Um, and I was lucky enough to meet Amelia um, Nordhook, who was also um, uh, very involved in, in energy and creating uh, energy literacy and providing opportunities for uh, sort of energy sovereignty, the beginnings of energy sovereignty, as I see it on Molokai. I got to volunteer as a grad student um, with a project that she was working on um, in partnership with the developer Groundswell. I uh, got to be sort of a, a behind the scenes uh, volunteer with some of my classmates, also from design at Stanford. Um, just really learned and loved a lot. So when I graduated and started this company uh, and the opportunity arose to continue working with these guys um, on Molokai, uh, I jumped at it. Mm, that's uh, asking for a challenge, isn't it? You. You've lived here, you know Molokai is special among all the islands. They call it the friendly island, however, sometimes to developers, it's not friendly. Uh, so community engagement is important. What kind of welcome have you found there? Ooh, um, I think 
So uh, initial skepticism, for sure, about me and who who I am, where did I come from, what am I doing here? I remember getting that question a lot. Uh, what what are you doing here? What are you getting out of it? And I remember uh, the first time I got that question, I answered, "Oh, I'm I'm getting nothing. I'm just a student. I'm just here for nothing." And uh, that answer was not sufficient. Um, I think the the true answer to that was I was getting a lot out of it, even though I wasn't getting paid technically. I was learning a lot. I was bringing those learnings back to Stanford. Um, I was uh, gaining experience that then turned into uh, this company that does make me money now. Um, so uh, I think uh, I learned a lot through through getting those hard questions and and being uh, able to answer them and then coming back as a company and and being able to say the first workshop that I hosted, you know, as the CEO of this company, uh, somebody asked me that same question. I was able to say, you know, this is my business model. Uh, if we're successful here in our partnership um, on developing a community energy project, then I will derive a developer's fee off of that and that will be transparent and we will negotiate that. Uh, which is sort of where we're at actually now in our development process, which is fun. Um, so have, have you been universally accepted or are there holdouts? Oh, um, I, think, uh, I think there's a lot of love and trust in our relationship right now, but uh, I have certainly been told by some that, uh, you know, they're monitoring the situation. It's a trust, but, uh, you know, I will... Uh, if the situation changes, I reserve the right to say, I don't support what we're doing here anymore. I don't support you doing that, which I think is fair. It keeps me on my toes. It's um, uh, we're having fun, but I also need to make sure I don't have, you know, unconditional trust to, to run the ship how I want to run the ship. We're running it together. Yeah, so it's, it's not just meet and greet. It's an ongoing engagement throughout the course of the project. Am I right? Yes, yeah, on a weekly, if not more than that, since mm, almost a year now um, over Zoom, which is wild. So from a business point of view, you know, you have to have predictability, reliability. You have to be able to tell your investors, you know, it's okay to put money into this because we have a, a fair shot. You know, we can moderate the risk. We can, we can make this work. Um, but if you're in, involved in a, you know, in a constant engagement and people have the right to, I mean, and you grant them the right to say no at any point along the way, what do you tell your investors about the prospect of the risk? And, um, you know, what, what, you know, cause the, the return has to be moderated by the prospect of the risk. What, what do you tell them? Um, I think that's a great question. And I think there's a lot of risk that comes in to energy development. There are a lot of things that could go wrong at any step in the way. Um, we only have half an hour. Ellie. <laughs> um, uh, but I honestly think that the biggest risk that I'm seeing in energy development in Hawaii right now is the community opposition. And I think that my investment in time uh, early on in um, uh, this development process. I, I feel like I'm in a less risky situation than other energy developers are. Um, uh, I think it's, it's time well spent, it's money well spent um, for me. Um, and there are other, I'm honestly more worried about other risks of when is the RFP finally gonna drop and is it gonna have new terms in it that are still favorable to this project? And uh, if we go for new market tax credits or opportunity zone funding, is, are those policies still gonna be live by the time that, uh, that we want to seek funding? Um, those risks feel riskier to me than the, the trust um, with the community that I feel like we have now. So it's, of course, it's clean energy, it's solar. And, um, you know, what's the status of solar on Molokai? I mean, Marco has had a hand in that. Um, how much progress has been made? And is the progress that, that has been made, um, you know, appropriate to the need, appropriate to the opportunities? Well, given the, the smallness of the grid there, there's only one single Miko power plant outside of Kanaka Kai that has... Uh, 
10 or so generators that they always run at least two, at least as far as I recall, only two, a minimum of two at once, because if one of them were to go down, uh, it wouldn't take the whole island down. And to, to circle back to your question, Jay, so what's the status of solar on Molokai? Uh, well, Molokai, along with Lanai, essentially got solar saturated several years ago in terms of rooftop solar, nothing in terms of, or very little in terms of commercial, no utility scale on Molokai. So it's been, it's been, a, uh, it's been a challenge uh, for those of us in the trenches in the, in the solar contracting business, because I've had a number of projects on Molokai over the past uh, X number of years, but essentially the grid has been all but saturated up until recently. So you say saturated, but I remember seeing a, a substantial diesel facility there. I also uh, saw the uh, the battery installation is pretty close to that. That's and there is a, there, there is there is a uh, a container of batteries at the power plant there, uh, but it is not per se for storing excess renewables. Although they may that be, may be something of an ancillary benefit, it was for. Uh, for other reasons, and, and if I'm not mistaken, I think Miko essentially got it from free for free from Hawaii Natural Energy Institute (HNEI). Uh, uh, you know, sp more specifically to what Ali's doing. You know, a little bit of background. So, 2015, uh, my senator friend Mike Gabbard was instrumental in getting a bill passed and signed into law, uh, known as Community Based Renewable Energy, or CBRE for short. And this is something that. Uh, over the past almost six years now since uh, the governor signed it into law. Uh, to my knowledge, there's not a single, not a single CBRE project that is acro uh, across the Hawaiian electric territory, service territories, three utilities, five islands, that is actually producing power today. Now I could be mistaken. One could have recently come back on, come online. But CBRE, I think everybody would agree has been a long gestation, a very long, too long gestation. And so why? If I'm, uh, why? Uh, my friend Jay, I think that question is probably better posed to our friends at uh, Hawaiian Electric Company rather than me opine on that. I think I'll leave it to them to explain that the answer to that uh, very, very good question. So specifically for Molokai, if I'm not mistaken, Ali, this is where your company comes in and is interested in pursuing a CBRE project on Molokai. Now let, let's kind of take a step back for, for our viewers and maybe you could first explain what CBRE is about in terms of how it actually works in the real world. And two, why it is of benefit to, in this case, the people of the Friendly Isle. Absolutely. I would be happy to take a stab at that. Um, so community-based renewable energy, a lot of other states uh, call it community solar. Um, uh, I really appreciate actually the name in Hawaii for it because I think it really draws on uh, the community-based aspect of the fact that it should be designed and owned uh, and sort of localized, uh, which a lot of community solar uh, isn't necessarily. Um, the idea behind it is that um, uh, for folks who can't put rooftop solar um, on their own home because they rent or they live in an apartment or they have a very shady uh, house, um, shady like trees, not um, shady sketchy. Um, and uh, we build a shared solar facility that is maybe on the order of half a megawatt, a quarter of a megawatt, 2.75 megawatts, for example, lovely size. Um, uh, and then uh, residential and commercial customers get to sign up. Uh, they pay a monthly fee or maybe an upfront fee um, to subscribe to a share of that output. Um, and then they get a uh, credit on their utility bill, much like you would have a credit on your utility bill if you had rooftop solar for whatever solar um, your rooftop panels produced, you get the credit for what your share um, of the community solar or the CBRE project benefit. So it's sort of like a, a three transaction process between the utility, um, a community solar project or what in Hawaii is called a subscriber organization is what the developer of that project is called, and then uh, rate payers. Just like a co-op. Yeah, 
Yeah, I think it is. It is. It uh, fits. It fits itself very well for a co-op, um, uh, which is, I think, why uh, the project that we are working on on Molokai that I'm working on in partnership with this community group, who is now, as of last Friday, is officially incorporated as a consumer cooperative in the state of Hawaii. Um, the Ho'ahu Energy Cooperative Molokai is the full name or HECM uh, is the uh, acronym. Um, uh, they, they have uh, realized this opportunity and realized that CBRE really fits what their goals are for community owned and locally decided energy. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty natural partnership for us. Well, that's very, that's very modern frontier, pioneer kind of stuff. One of the things um, you know, that I learned about, what's her name, Amelia, uh, over there, is that she had um, she had a desire working with uh, some of your predecessor developers to uh, have a piece of the action for the benefit of the community, um, so that the community. Uh, you referred to energy sovereignty a minute ago. I'm not sure what that covers, but um, <laughs> I remember her talking about you know the notion of. Uh, allowing a piece of the project and a piece of the profits um, to go to the community. And I wonder if that has come up, is that part of your project? And in any event, what is energy sovereignty and what's the relationship? Um, I, I would say, okay, so backing up a little bit, energy sovereignty to me anyways, is the idea of uh, decision-making over energy resources, decision-making power over where energy infrastructure goes, what does it look like, where do the financial benefits flow, there are all sorts of uh, decisions that can be made about our renewable energy infrastructure that right now are held pretty closely by a small group of organizations. Um, uh, and uh, to answer your question about is that a piece of our project, I would say that is the entirety of our project. Um, I think it's a pretty unconventional relationship that we have that I as the developer am really more of like the implementation arm. They are the brains behind the project. They make all the decisions. We make it together, but um, uh, we hold Zoom meetings around site selection and uh, screen share and zoom over uh, different parcels and and they the community members know way more than I do about historical land use current land ownership. Uh, what areas are going to be flooded at what times of year versus other areas, where are we more likely to run into um, uh, cultural sites that we wouldn't want to disturb versus other parcels so like it is, it is very much uh, an exported decision-making process um, down to who subscribes. Uh, we talked this past weekend over our Zoom workshop about where do we want to get our money from? Um, the, I mean, where do we want to get our money from? Uh, we don't exactly get to pick, uh, but we do get to pick who we ask. Um, and, and they are a part of all of those conversations. So uh, is, this will be formalized in the sense that you know, the community, you know, the members of the community who are part of the, what we call it, sovereignty management, let's call it that, are they going to be baked in? Are they going to be, are they going to be directors? Um, are they going to have um, a say on an ongoing basis in the management of the property project? Absolutely. Uh, so the plan right now is um, uh, to the extent possible, they will be um, a, a, uh, a partial owner in the project in year one. Um, if we can uh, raise money for their co-op through grants and crowdfunding and uh, particular loans that are aimed at um, community ownership of energy assets. Um, so they will be a partial owner, if not in year one, then certainly in year seven, year 10. Um, that is the whole reason why we are doing this is to enable community ownership, which um, comes with it the ability to decide um, uh, certain things about, you know, how does it get decommissioned. Um, in particular, I would also say that the co-op will be a really important um, 
entity in the subscriber management uh, part of the project. As you might imagine, if we build a 2.75 megawatt project, we need to recruit a whole boatload of um, residential and some commercial and maybe some um, government uh, subscribers. Um, and right now they're defining uh, what are our goals for that? Who do we want to recruit? How are we going to recruit them? Who gets to benefit? Um, does everyone benefit equally? Or um, do we uh, um, benefit some more than others depending on need or depending on, on certain other metrics? Well, I, um, are you, you're not living in Hawaii now, but you probably have to come back plenty to, to, um, you know, to monitor this through to a completion. You're going to need all the skills you've got at Middlebury and Stanford and everywhere <laughs> in order to make this happen. This is a very challenging uh, operation you've described. And I wonder if you could compare and contrast it to KIUC and Kauai. Everybody, everybody seems to agree that KIUC is very well managed as a co-op and it, it, it demonstrates the, the benefits of, of, of co-op energy. So how is this like or how is it contrasted with KIUC? Mm -hmm. um, I think I'll answer a little bit and then I might uh, bop that to Marco who has a greater vision of uh, the history of cooperatives in Hawaii. But I would say that from what I, uh, the co-op and uh, I have talked about, uh, I think the co-op's larger vision is to grow into that role of a utility cooperative, um, building capacity over time. Um, and there have been movements on Molokai in the past towards cooperative ownership. Um, and I think owning and managing a CPRE project is, is a perfect step in that direction. Um, uh, but there are certainly um, other differences. Marco, what do you think about how this effort compares to KIUC? Uh, I think uh, before I go there, I just I wanted to go back to CBRE uh, because of the you know it's focused on Molokai. So you know just to be clear, as I understand CBRE in this case, it is not fractional ownership of the actual assets of the actual generating solar plant. It's essentially fractional receipt of the output of the plant, right? And the draw or the, the what, what's the motivation for someone on Molokai to, to become a subscriber? And you know, the, there are two that I see, at least two. Uh, most people are motivated, uh, or a lot of people are motivated by the notion it's gonna reduce their overall electric bill, right? Because Molokai is uh, got some of the highest, or if not the highest electric cost in the state typically. So, I would assume that a subscriber would get a be paying a lower rate for that fractional output from this two plus something megawatt CVRE project. So they would see a reduction in their bill. Everybody likes to see that. And then second, this is a way that they are able to tangibly support the island becoming more green, more renewable in terms of burning less fossil fuel, producing more indigenous power uh, there on the island. Am I leaving anything out there, Allie? Um, I don't think so. Well, uh, I would maybe add that particularly in the context of the Ho'ahu Energy Cooperative Molokai owning this project, they're supporting a step towards local ownership. This is one of the first projects that is even proposing um, uh, that um, and I think there's a lot of like social will around local ownership and, and the emotional experience of becoming part of a cooperative and growing towards something together. Well, so as, you... as, Marco, as Marco has suggested, there are two levels of community contact here. One is, uh, one is the, uh, the cooperative where members of the community um, can be members of the cooperative and uh, sort of like KIUC. Uh, and the other is the community-based solar, um, which um, you know is a, a very refreshing and uh, promising model, where uh, individuals can simply share in the in the in the uh, uh, in the product of the of the facility. They could buy it uh, instead of buying it from the utility. They buy it from the community 
based solar. So there's two ways that um, the, the people in Molokai can participate. That's very interesting. So uh, do you expect that, that they, the same individuals would be at, at, at two levels? What's the difference between, um, you know, the community that would, mm, you know, be active in the, in the cooperative and the community that would be active as, as consumers? Um, I think that's a great question. And, and as I alluded to before, we're, we're in the middle of that dialogue about what does it mean to be a subscriber? Who are we recruiting? Are subscribers the same as cooperative members? Um, are there different? Uh, I think when we incorporated through their discussions, um, there are potentially multiple levels of uh, cooperative membership. And there are people on the island who are not eligible to become a subscriber of CBRE because they're off grid or they have rooftop solar already, which excludes them from being a CBRE uh, subscriber. But they, they still want to be part of the club because it's a cool club to be a part of and, and we have a lot of fun together. Uh, so cooperative membership and subscriber CBRE subscribership are not necessarily the same. Um, uh, but they could, they're probably a, a large overlap, I would guess. Um, and I will also note that when uh, Ho'ahu Energy Cooperative Molokai uh, structured their organization, they're a non-stock co-op. So you don't have to um, uh, um, have $10,000 to buy into the co-op to be a member. It's, um, they're, they're much more focused on equitable access to membership. And so they might be a subscriber, uh, a membership fee um, but there are other ways uh, to benefit from being a part of that. You don't have to be an investor. I guess that's the way it works at KIUC, and I guess that's what you have in mind for the Hawaii Island uh, Co-op, Marco. Uh, but let me let me ask you, Marco. Um, you know, you mentioned before that um, part of this is premised on the notion that this community-based solar would would actually be cheaper to subscribers than than what they have now, buying directly from utility. Why do you say that? Has, has that been shown and proven? Um, what, what is, how does it pencil out? Uh, what is the magic sauce, you know, the, the special sauce that could make it cheaper? Uh, I, well, I mean, um, Ali's more into the, in the, into the weeds and depths of her particular project than I am, certainly. And I mean, I think it's, uh, it's just common sense, Jay, that I mean, you're you're going to get that that small sliver of people, the first adopters who who will be willing to pay, let's say, a small premium for green energy, green energy compared to more dirty energy from a combustion power plant. But the reality is, I mean, especially again on Molokai, where you have a substantial, a sub substantially high level of poverty people living on the edge, I won't call them hunter gatherers, but they're certainly hunter, hunter, big into hunting and fishing their subsistence. So in my view, in order to, to gain a substantial amount of subscribers, you absolutely positively have to provide these, these potential subscribers with the benefit or the promised benefit, they're going to save money. They're gonna save money. Yeah, one last question, Ali. Um... And that is this, what stands between you and the realization of the vision um, right now? Ooh. What has to happen before you can achieve what you want? Ooh, um, I think the biggest, the biggest obstacle ahead that we are working towards, and it's not an obstacle, but uh, it's a challenge. It's a race. Um, there's an RFP. Uh, that we will um, bid uh, a project into. Actually, we're going to bid two small-ish project or two projects of uh, differing sizes into the same RFP. We will have some stiff competition in there. Um, what we know right now is that we will be bidding against the utilities self-build team, uh, which means that um, just as we would have done if they were not in the competition. Um, uh, we will be working really hard to find uh, lower cost of installation, lower cost of capital, raising grants. Um, there are a couple of grants in particular that we've got our eye on. Um, 
I think, yeah, I think uh, making the numbers pencil now. I think we've got a lot of momentum around uh, community support uh, among the group of people that we work with. Uh, we've also committed to know that we need to expand that. There are obviously um, as many more people on Molokai than are currently in our Zoom workshops. Um, and we will continue to get the word out uh, before yep. we get our bid. Emily, to or excuse me, Ali, to be clear, when you mention you're bidding against a utility company, I assume you're talking about Pacific Current uh, or Miko. No, uh, the uh, Hiko's self-build team. Um, they're they're uh, it's a different entity within Hiko itself that are Hiko employees that are working on um, a bid um, to develop a 2.5 megawatt CPRE project. Okay, well, that's interesting to note. And do you know whether Pacific Current, which is an unregulated subsidiary under Hawaiian Electric Industries, is also bidding on it? Because they certainly have taken a substantial dive into this particular development space across the state. Do you know if they're in the game as well? Um, I do not know. We were in um, early talks with them when we were interviewing different development companies um, to partner with my company on the bid since I'm a newbie. Um, well, I need a, another company to, to partner with me. Um, and they brought a company to the table and we were initially talking to them. We went with a different developer. Um, so I don't know where they're at right now. Okay. Marco, we're almost out of time. And I, of course, I want to ask you, you know, summarize and, and, and point us forward on this. Um, <sighs> but I also want to ask you to react. Um, what, what is your impression here? Um, uh, you know, you've, you've followed energy in Molokai, especially renewables in Molokai for a lifetime. Uh, and you're very familiar with uh, the dynamics of that island. So query, um, you know, what are the prospects here as you see them? Oh, Jay, you have a you have a knack for point for posing uh, juicy questions. <laughs> yeah, I I feel like I'm threading a needle here, Jay. And I'll tell you why. Uh, one is because, uh, as you mentioned, I've been in the energy arena on Molokai now uh, for the past what 14, 15 years, very tangibly doing projects over there. And I know the difficulty as well as anybody who's done projects there on multiple levels of doing work on that island and doing work in the utility uh, or the energy sphere. Uh, challenges, great challenges. And uh, at times there's some cynicism that I must admit in my older years, I'm, I, I, I feel some, some cynicism in terms of uh, how difficult it is. And at the same time, I, I want to be encouraging to, I want to be supportive of what Ali and her group are doing, because I was young too, believe it or not, as were you, Jay, long ago, right? In a galaxy far, far away. I don't know about young. you, Marco, but I'm still 16. Yeah. You know, for some reason, that's not a surprise to me, Jay, but I appreciate you mentioning that. So thank you. So I, I want to be very encouraging of Ali and her efforts. And at the same time, I'm also somewhat battle scarred in uh, working on that island uh, so you know the, you know i think my I'm, I, my number one uh, takeaway or uh, guidance to you ali if you were to ask me for it is i think you're doing whatever you know the, best, the the most that you can do you should do the most that you can to get community involvement community support uh that that's a very difficult island at times to be able to to rally the troops and to get behind uh a project of any kind that they perceive as coming from the outside. So I really appreciate your, uh, your heart and uh, commitment to that. And uh, I will, of course, wish you the best. Yeah, and I want to join in that. I, you, know, I, I, you know, welcome to the fray, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But also, we need you. We need you to you know, bring your vision here. We need you to, uh, to plant the flag anywhere in these islands to, to demonstrate how important um, these these possibilities are to our future. So thank you for making this contribution. I I know uh, it'll be a while before you see Dime One, um, but I, I I wish you well. We all wish you well. We want you to. See. Thank you so much. I'm uh, I'm very excited about where we're at and feel very lucky uh, that I have the partnerships uh, that I have with the Molka E community and and yeah, hope to spread that across the state if can. All right. Thank you, Ali. Ali Andrews, and uh, 
Marco Mangelsdorf. Great discussion. And uh, it really opens my eyes into the possibilities on Holy Thank you so much.